Lisa, great to have you here. Actually, I haven't posted on uh, Vox Lab TV for the longest time. I'm so happy that I can actually post again a video to talk about something that has been on the news every day, I would say, which is uh, NFT, non-fungible tokens. Um, we met in uh, uh, Helsinki more than two years ago, uh, talking about uh, ICOs and cryptocurrencies, but you've been in the space, in the art for much longer than that, since 2008. And you definitely have a uh, opinion on what's going on and probably you have a vision as well. And we have been talking about this whole craze around uh, uh, NFT. And, and I think I, I find myself very much in line with your vision. And I would like you to share uh, your vision with uh, all those that are uh, looking into NFT for the first time or blockchain for the first time, but most importantly for those like you and, and like uh, like me in my early stage when I was doing uh, digital art and then I got absorbed in the corporate life, but you continued on your uh, true north and you are probably now the right person in the right place at the right time and with the right vision. Tell me what you think about it. Well, uh, one of the things that really impressed me so much about meeting you uh, and hearing you speak in Helsinki uh, a couple of years ago is that uh, you were saying a bunch of the hard things uh, to say about ICOs or cryptocurrencies altogether. What, what about them were, was hype and what was the dangers and what, what the, how the cycles were going to behave and, and, and things like that. And uh, I, I kind of realized that this is always the best way to, because I've been a digital artist for 12 years now, and I invented my own process, and I, I got a, a reputation going in the, in the legacy art system, so to speak, as well. But as, a, as an innovator, that was a hard platform to be on. And when crypto art, uh, or let's say Bitcoin hit me uh, properly almost four years ago now, I was all in immediately for a multitude of reasons, not only because NFTs were uh, in an inevitable thing to happen, that is that I call the liberation of a whole creative class of people, because essentially you can be a, a 3D animator, you can be a designer, you can be a drummer, you can be a classical step dancer, and you can somehow record or output your digital uh, creativity onto these new emerging platforms. And we're going virtual anyway. We're uh, building on Somnium spaces and crypto voxels and having these meetups and, and COVID has certainly sped the, the, the process along for us to get uh, tokenizing and putting value on our digital creation, creativity, well, which has been, we've been waiting for that ever since the birth of computers, because most people in the world, they sort of associate the computer of being something that is very, very good at replicating things. And especially if it's in the form of a song or an image or something like that. Now the technology underneath Bitcoin and Ethereum has now finally stopped this whole um, uh, art copying machine. And you can now with this technology authenticate even one-to-one -one, uh, pieces like which is essentially what non-fungible means is that it's not interchangeable with anything it's not like the dollar that you can exchange to a different dollar no it's more like the original mona lisa and you upload it as an artist to some platform and then that's it that circulates around the world and can be authenticated that it comes from the artist itself solving a lot of problems in the art world altogether even with authentication let alone that this digital output can now have a channel but we are now in the first hype cycle of NFTs, and it does feel very, very similar uh, to the ICO craze of 2017. And because uh, I came in effectively uh, to see the first bull cycle of cryptos, and uh, and of course it was super exciting, and and you got you sense that there's resources there, but there was also ideological alignment. There was many different kinds of things. But then I also saw the crash. And me personally, there was a company that promised me a million dollar gallery in London and a world tour and all of these kinds of things that I, I told my, my lady to quit her job that she was killing herself uh, doing over. And then the money disappeared and the company disappeared and everything vanished in smoke. So I've already been around the block a few times to see what crypto is like and what's going on. Uh, so, but essentially this feels very similar to the ICO hype. And it's a bit of a you could say a dick move to kind of in the middle of the gold rush to be putting up red flags and say, hold on guys, maybe this is, and it's a pandemic as well. Everyone's livelihoods have been uh, destroyed uh, and many people are in a crisis. And now all of a sudden this whole cr uh, class of people is rushing in like hordes to 
mint their NFTs and they sense the money, they sense the hype, and they, it's a part of it, and they mint everything. And the market itself is not very sophisticated to know what's what, how to distinguish in between projects that have been around for a long time, what is just a one-to-one -one copy of something that has been done to death in the art world before, what is the 3D model just ripped from another site of an astronaut with put, put on a couple of lighting effects. I mean, you as an uh, Adobe expert know all of these different kinds of tricks of how people can shortcut uh, things to look really good and maybe they're not so valuable because everyone and their grandma is now making an NFT of an astronaut. So it's very unlikely that even though you might get a first response feel but this is a super cool thing. It's an astronaut with a uh, Ethereum logo in the helmet or something like that. And you recognize the world and you're like, oh, this looks amazing. Uh, you might not realize that there's like 100 artists making the same image right now. And you, you're going to throw $10,000 at it thinking that it's a super rare thing. And this is an amazing artist and da, 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 da. But uh, uh, in a little while, uh, you will realize that there's about 10,000 astronauts on the market right now. And many people threw a lot of money at it. And once this hype cycle, the first hype cycle dies down, and it'll probably be the next three years or something like that, that it's going to calm down a lot. Uh, the strong projects, the ones with backing, they, they will survive and thrive. And some of these early investments into these NFTs, much like with the ICOs, are going to be very, very good bets. And it's going to make a lot of people very wealthy. It's going to help a lot of artists. The, the scene is going to thrive. And this very needed innovation is now just booming to the surface. And it will have definitely a future ahead of it and a long one. But uh, I, I'm just saying that there's a... Um, I watched the NFT scene uh, grow from the very first things that when the first whale came along, <clears throat> who he started supporting. And and this is a, a difficult thing to, to, to state because I, I want everyone to live well and, and make a bunch of money and, and, and thrive under these difficult circumstances. But I saw how this space was born. I saw that um, like for some of the first movers on the on coming up with the platforms, let's say they're Silicon Valley guys, they've already made a bunch of money. They're the smartest guys in the room. They're super wealthy. They, they're risk takers. They're forward thinking. There are many of these things. But most of these guys don't even have a one of one of art. And they like to feel very, very powerful. They like to feel like the smartest guys in the room, but they might just not have the expertise to know that in the art world, for example, not ever would it have happened that someone one-to-one -one copies a, a, a dead artist, a famous dead artist's masterwork and implements a Bitcoin logo into it. And then that becomes like a millions and millions selling art piece. I, I mean, that's just, it wouldn't happen because it would, be, it would have been considered retarded. Uh, but here, because we don't have the foundations to understand of what creativity is on multiple levels or what, what the art world painstakingly for thousands of years built, but also inflated during the last 40 years into, into something else. It, it's such a multifaceted thing. So uh, I don't want to be the bringer of bad news and just say, oh, there's nothing here. There absolutely is. It is the future of art, uh, hands down. But also be, be, be careful with the first impulse buys and much like with the ICOs, if you don't understand anything about the whole project or the space or whatever, just at least be cautious. And I know whatever I'll say, it won't affect anything because what's going to happen is that people are going to dump all of their money into this market now and then many, many will be burnt. And then we will, those of us who've been building solid foundations for 12 years or even more, We'll have to suffer again people saying that NFTs are a scam after the hype dies because many people lost a lot of money. But at least I will have on record that I was here during the gold rush saying that, you know, at least have some patience and maybe do a little bit of research. Thank you for sharing that. In fact, it is a very multi dimensional analysis that you are bringing up because you have to know a bit of investment, a bit of blockchain for sure. You have to understand what are tokens and you have to understand art and each of them might acquire a lifetime of expertise individually and now you are all of a sudden required to have the experience of four lifetimes in in one and that, that's where as you correctly say some people might get hurt badly some other day in, you, you might take a person a and person b doing exactly the same thing uh, but one get lucky and the other doesn't. And, and just listening to the story of sheer luck of someone that bought 
something for very little and all of a sudden is a millionaire, it doesn't tell a 0.1% of the whole picture. And, and it's important that the listeners uh, know that, that you can just jump in and you are at the wrong time and or sometimes you jump in and you are at the right time, but you've been looking at it for very far and from for very long. And, and that's why I'm so interested in hearing uh, your opinion. And perhaps our listeners are also interested in finding out where are you now because you have a fantastic backdrop behind you. And perhaps you can give us a tour of your stunning facilities. Okay, well, very good. Yeah, thanks for this uh, opportunity opportunity to present it. Yeah, this is the world's first NFT uh, digi digital art production studio. So this is the media part of it. We're getting the, um, the podcast set up over here, which is one thing. I, I wonder if the lights are off or on here. Uh, just going after the curtain, uh, it's a little dark here, but this is the green screen studio production area and, uh, and uh, lights and things like that. So essentially, the the entrance is not yet done, but art will bring you in. And there's augmented reality art pieces along the way. If you walk in with your uh, mobile phone, uh, it's not only the art that is physically printed into these large things, but it's also art that becomes alive in your screen. And some of these pieces like this one here called The Brave is also an augmented reality piece, but we're working with this German genius called Frank Spotsholt to turn it into 50 million voxels, alive pixels, as a virtual reality version. So you can just hop on this art couch and then put on the VR headset uh, to uh, either augmented reality, check these and see how they come alive, but as well as VR. And to some people like this collaboration that we, we're trying to get Brittany Kaiser, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower into the country, that she would then be here in the green screen studio and we will turn her into digital cutting edge NFT art with her life story and everything to do about data ownership and data security. Uh, so things like that, it's a, it's a very multi-level facility and it's housed actually inside of a print factory. So whatever the, these physical uh, representations like this table, for example, that was a Tone Vase commission piece uh, that, that we made for him, we turned it into the podcast table and uh, uh, it, it'll on multi-level house uh, talks about creativity, art, and value, uh, allow people to transform themselves into art, uh, experience the art both physically and, uh, and digitally. Uh, and then, of course, whatever is bought here physically, is, it's inside of the factory. So we can manufacture these um, works to the size that anyone really desires and ship them all over the world directly from this spot. So it's a, it really is a pretty incredible venture altogether. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Uh, of, of course, and obviously far from us to advise uh, on any investment. I'm not a financial advisor. I don't know about you, but last time I checked, you were an artist. Uh, I, I would say that the, the message that we should uh, give to the listeners for this very impromptu conversation that we had is just be cautious. But if they want to take action and they want to uh, engage with you, or they want to engage with your art or with your projects, what are the best ways to connect with you? What are the next uh, steps that you recommend to someone that is approaching uh, uh, this space and they want to get their hands dirty with some paint? Uh, do, do you mind if I share just a couple of minutes of a larger perspective that really I think would help people uh, get their sort of true north, as you say, about the whole thing, and then share the, the connect details if they, if they want. Absolutely, that's uh, ask. <laughs> Cool. Because the, the, uh, I'm rather proud of, of coming to this realization is that and, and this is definitely for the true crypto people as well, uh, because they will understand this immediately, is that when Richard Nixon in 1971, when he took out the, the gold standard from standard from underneath the dollar, then uh, it reflected directly to art. And I didn't realize how directly it influenced art at that time, because uh, effectively then Andy Warhol, uh, he had this place he called literally the factory from which he started making all of these different prints and pop culture and whatever. And he sort of, at that point, art divorced itself from uh, let's say cave paintings, uh, ancient Egypt, uh, the um, sort of enlightenment period and the whole of human history essentially. And it became sort of pop culture and shiny things for the rich that then Jeff Koons and da Damien Hirst and others took to a whole nother level making even a whole bunch of more even crazy money. So that's 
one side of the coin, what I call fiat art that we started around 71. And then the other side of it was that the deconstruction and postmodernist movements uh, that essentially were was a socialist agenda that kind of added to it uh, race and gender and a couple of other things, uh, while saying that there's no truth whatsoever, everything is relative, it still somehow managed to keep a core of Marxism as as the, the sort of foundation of the whole thing. So the activist side or the more serious side of art was reserved for a very narrow path philosophically of, of let's say, the postmodernist deconstructivist movement that then sort of atomized everything to the point that you can now go to a gallery in Miami and strap a banana on a wall and insult everyone and do a bit of wash trading and, and sort of uh, all the world's press goes crazy. And every, in everyone's minds, people are just like, art is dead. There's no value in this. It's all a scam, essentially. So what Bitcoin did and why I hopped into making crypto art to begin with is that when Bitcoin stopped the money printing era in terms of the, the sort of fiat government um, sort of money printing altogether, which is ever since 71 been the thing, it also stopped in art philosophically that you need to uh, sort of um, be dependent on the fiat system or fiat philosophy, which is these two things, is shiny things for the rich or narrow political propaganda. It liberated any artist now to just via NFTs make anything that they want ideologically. You don't have to be under a corporate thumb or a government ideology uh, or anything like that. You don't have to be. You can just say what you want. If you're inspired by the spirituality of Egypt, you can make that into art and you can directly, without anyone's permission, put it on a marketplace on Rarible or OpenSea or something like that. And th then you just find buyers for it and you're free to express yourself and make a living as you see fit if you just find buyers for it. One of the reasons why I do this kind of education is that not only do I want to liberate artists for truly expressing who they are and express and uh, explore anything that they would like to, but also because this truly has the potential of making art a whole lot better. It's opening up the arteries of expression back to uh, ever since going back to cave paintings and body painting, which are which are arguably the two world's most oldest expressions, and 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 whatever it is that you want to say, you're now able to say. Uh, so it. it it's simultaneously, even though in this hype cycle there's things to be cautious of, it's also in terms of liberating human creativity and very, very brilliant people to be able to say what they want to say and express themselves. It is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever witnessed in my life to happen. So I don't, I don't want to be just a bear. I just want to take the true scope of it so you can truly consider what is valuable and who, which kind of artists you personally would like to support. Uh, would you like to, do you have some dreams of yourself that you wanted to create something, but there just wasn't money in it? Uh, the, well, like yourself, you said you went more to the corporate route. All of this amazing knowledge that you have of uh, Adobe right now, you could be flying as a full-time artist making more money than you could ever make in the corporate world in no time with your expertise and your insight into the whole space. So this is what I mean. It, it truly is a liberation, but with liberation comes a lot of responsibility too. So this is the Grant's perspective. And on Twitter, you can find me at Art by Vesa, V-E-S-A. And uh, my platform where you can see my background and the collectors and what I've done before in the crypto art space and altogether is artforcrypto.com. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Actually, I think we can call it an episode, this one, and we can publish what we have recorded so far. It was really impromptu, but perhaps next time if we, if you are game and you want to do something uh, instructional, there are a couple of things that we could do. We could connect again and, uh, and record a, um, a quick um, overview on how to get started, step by step, what you're supposed to do, uh, MetaMask or whatever, um, whatever platform you decide to, to use, a wallet you decide to use to tokenize your art. And maybe we could do also something a bit more fun. We could go on uh, uh, Nifty's, for example, and start looking at what's available out there and have a sort of an art critic lesson from you that explains what is what has potential and what, what, uh, what to stay away from, basically, what's dangerous investment and what's potentially good investment. Uh, thank you for sharing all these. It was really refreshing. These are great to talk to you and uh, 
uh, I hope that uh, our viewers will find uh, value in uh, what they have seen. And uh, since everyone now is saying it, I would say remember to subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell for uh, the upcoming uh, new videos. And um, I will leave your contacts in the description below. So those who are interested in following you, they can do so. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Stefano. Real pleasure chatting with you. Likewise.